Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another episode of Security Matters Hawaii. Today we have Kevin Wilhelm with us from Signet Electronic Systems, and we're going to be giving a voice to the integrator today who gets the bulk of the work out there. Uh, Kevin, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Right on. I hope you're not driving. <laughs> no. Awesome. Okay, good deal. Um, I tell you what, let's start off with um, maybe just give our, our viewers a little history, as uh, uh, much as you care to share, you know, about your background in the industry. Absolutely. Uh, so I came into the industry about 10 years ago, um, primarily doing, you know, small fire alarm systems, you know, a little intrusion system, Vista with Demco panels, stuff like that. Um, time went on, I moved up, and uh, now I do design and engineering for uh, a lot of high rises in the Boston area, uh -huh. um, as well as a number of uh, K through 12 environments as well. Wow. So the um, the high rise environment's been interesting. Did you did you start there because of the firework that you did previously? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, every high rise is required to have a very complex fire alarm system, um, and we were very familiar with doing those. We had a lot of contacts on the property management side, and you know, they start putting in these turnstiles and these really high end elevator systems and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, they're coming to us and saying, "Hey, you know, is that something that you guys can do?" And initially, we just kind of said, yeah, and it's turned out to be a really good market for us. Wow. And is, is um, the, so what we've seen in Hawaii is, is a lot of video in that market, but not a lot of access control and not a lot of integration to elevators. So in the East Coast, is, um, how's that market progressing uh, with like some of the newer technologies? Yeah, I mean, we're actually, we're seeing a lot of integration to the elevators. Um, so it's a term called elevator destination dispatch. Yeah. Um, it's a system provided by, you know, Otis and, and Schindler and people like that. What we're doing is we're taking our standard credentials and then also uh, QR code barcode readers and integrating them into both the access control and then also the elevator destination dispatch. So you walk up to a turnstile, you present your credential, whether it's a temporary QR barcode or a more traditional access code. Um, turnstile opens up. It says, hey, you know, go to bay three. Because Bay 3 is going to go to your elevator right on time, and everything on there and is all managed. But it's not relays anymore. That's really the cool part. It's all being done over, you know, IP communication. It's not ones and zeros, you know, in the traditional relay sense. It's real data strings with actual information and, you know, credential information. Right on. Have, um, so we did, we've done a few of those here. Did you get any pushback at all from the HJ for being tied to the elevator controller? Like, in other words, if the... Now, now, you know, that security server, if it has a comms issue that tends to put that elevator into a, uh, maybe a degraded mode of operation, um, have you seen any of any, uh, that kind of stuff where it, maybe it drives the elevator to the ground floor or something? Where, you know, before access control systems didn't really um, impinge upon elevator operations. Um, luckily, not a ton yet. I mean, certainly we experience that all the time on the fire alarm side, but... Um, for the elevator destination dispatch, I haven't seen that quite yet. Um, typically, they're running a full, you know, elevator system on their end, and we're just giving them the data string. Mm -hmm. um, and then for fail-safe purposes, the security desk usually has some more, I'll call it traditional uh, physical commands for elevator control. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that sounds nice. So is, uh, what do you think the, the, the greatest challenge has been in those environments? I mean, here it seems to be the user sort of training um, but what, what have you seen there? How, how's, how's it been accepted by the users? You know, I, I would agree with you 100%. You know, um, the staff that's typically managing these systems at, at a front-end location, um, they're not professional IT staff. They're usually um, part-time security guards, sometimes even contracted out. So the coordination between the owner of the building, the tenants in all these different spaces, and then the, the third party that's actually doing the security on site has been challenging at times because we have no control and the owner even to a certain extent doesn't have a ton of control over who the security guard is at the desk so you know if they're shuffling people around from their standpoint it's training all sorts of different people and when you're doing these visitor badges it can become quite a challenge wow interesting so what sort of penetration do you think you've achieved let's just say in i'm presuming you work in like downtown boston but um with destination dispatch it's very new um, nope. It's not like in New York City where you see it all over the place. There's a few locations that have it, um, but certainly every new high rise I see going up, which in Boston is quite a few of them, um, all of them are going to elevator destination dispatch and integration into access control and that you know higher level software level. That's awesome. Yeah, it's um 
here's it's kind of a retrofit market and so it's i think it's they kind of wait for that elevator system to run its lifespan and get their their usage out of it but they are on the replacement so there's definitely you know i'd say five eight ten percent maybe sort of market penetration of destination dispatch in our in our office buildings um not so much in the hotels and things like that yet um Correct. so go ahead yeah no um boston's a very hot market right now for new you know high-rise buildings um there's an area we do very well um in it's called the boston seaport and if you look at pictures of it from 20 years ago it was a big parking lot um ah. now every building down there is 10 to 15 plus stories and we're just seeing tremendous growth in that area in particular wow that's awesome um is it is, are you seeing that that also that technological sort of change in the condominium market do you have a lot of high-rise condominiums in town um not so much an elevator destination dispatch but they're the high-end condos are, i definitely want the whiz bang stuff you know they don't want just an access control credential it's got to be on the phone um all the cameras they want to have different types of analytics you know they want really high-end stuff and it's very cool once again you know you're taking a traditional access control output and then they want to tie it to their lighting system in their room they want to tie it to the hvac and do all this really cool integrations between systems nice um what about um lpr are you seeing uh, license plate recognition used to allow people into the gate uh, i've definitely started to see that happen on um the residential you know properties like condominiums and stuff in honolulu i don't know if, if uh, that's popular up there or not absolutely um we're seeing it both on the condominiums and then also in the um, the office space so a lot of our offices will typically have um a garage built into the lower levels of it so same type of idea you know uh so we're we're a jetta tech dealer and uh Genetech does a really nice job integrating their access control as a part of their their single centralized software okay um and in your um uh, other markets so are are these typically mixed use sort of facilities or is there retail and, and other types of of of, uh, of uh, operations inside these buildings or are they typically just straight um you know like office towers it varies a little bit um every project's a little different there are some you know depending on the height sometimes they'll mix and have a hotel for a few levels condos for a few oh. levels and office for a few levels um so we, we see all the above you know we do see some still dedicated you know pure residential systems but a lot of them are, are residential on the upper levels and the ground floor is going to be you know restaurants and some other sort of retail like oh. that interesting yeah i boston is one city i've never been to so i'm gonna have to get up there and check it out it sounds like it sounds like you guys are working sort of at the, the leading edge so give us a, a feel for the size of your office do you have uh your your solutions architect yourself so you're sort of the pre-sale engineering post-sale engineering or how, how do you guys work the market there both um so i do pre and post sales um i primarily work with i'll call them higher end end users you know i'm not really working with 7-elevens uh okay. something that has been around since the 1970s we have about 150 employees um 55 of those are technicians we're exclusively in the new england area we're we're based just south of boston um so we really probably strongly in you know the rhode island boston and up to new hampshire and maine market hmm. interesting do you have um do you guys have a federal group as well yeah we are on the gsa okay. um and we do a lot of work with different federal agencies um so we're we're gsa i apologize forget the number of the schedule but yeah we're on the gsa and have done uh, federal agencies in the the Boston area. In the Boston area, okay. I didn't know how. I didn't know if a lot of the a lot of the firms your size are kind of spread out. So you guys work just from one central headquarters. Uh, we do have a small satellite office in Rhode Island and Maine, but uh, New England's not a, a very big geographical area. Ah. Um, so ninety percent of our work is you know Massachusetts near Boston, then Rhode Island. Okay. Um, so uh, outside of the high rises, what uh, what other markets do you work in? We do a lot in K through twelve. Oh, schools, um, awesome. You know, schools, okay. Oh yeah. What what you know, um, and, so? And where we're seeing. Go ahead. We're seeing a lot of schools, and you know they're transitioning to, you know, tying their access control into what I'll call critical communications. Um, so you know it's having a panic event and not just doing a lockdown, but also providing information, you know, to to give people the ability to respond appropriately. Hmm. What um and so how is the penetration there? So I'm, are you familiar with uh, NSCA like that? uh pass program i think it's a partner alliance for safer schools or what sort of guidance uh, do you see boss i'm presuming you're meaning like municipal government schools or are they private owned i'm not sure how it works up there but what what sort of guidance uh, do you guys see them using i'm sorry typically they're municipal 
Okay, and is uh, it? Do they have a? Do they have some standards that they're sort of trying to drive towards achieving? I know that the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools has sort of like four tiers of a build out, you know, so that a school can kind of wrap its mind around, you know, where it wants to get to. Are you seeing just wholesale forklift come in, bring us the good stuff? In the Boston area, it's it's been a lot of you know totally new construction, um, which oh. from my standpoint is great. You know, you're talking you know. Two hundred million dollar high schools all over the place. It's it's, it's a really good market, um, you know. So a lot of that's once again being architect driven. But the state does has a, have a set of guidelines, and then it's working with architects and engineers to educate them in the latest technologies and, and ways to meet those guidelines, while also talking to superintendents as well and making sure everyone's kind of on board with it. Wow. So is that a, a bid market for you guys, or are you sort of the like the industry leader in that in that K through twelve space up there, or how, how's the, how does the market work? So we do have a state contract and, you know, some purchases are able to be made off a state contract. Typically for new construction, though, which is, you know, the large bulk of the K-12, um, that's all, all through public bid market. Hmm, awesome. And it is, so you have, you mentioned a couple of different markets. So are those, do you work like vertical market specific or do you tend to also work on other projects outside of just, just schools and high rises? Yeah, I work on, you know, other projects outside of that. Um, I've actually uh, just left a, a higher ed customer, um, which is a totally different, you know, set of needs in a K through 12. And you're talking about a real large, large open camp. Um, and then we also deal with, you know, private corporations as well, not just high rises. You know, we have multiple sites and, and working with them from a consultative perspective on those remote sites. Awesome. And so do you have a team that, um, that you, you know, you guys work in teams or you just get projects come in and you guys will assign people to projects as they as they roll along. There's about four or five sales reps I work with on the uh, the pre-sales side and then about four or five project managers I work with on the post-sales side. Uh, really good team. Everyone's been in the industry for a long time now. Um, you know, very, very, very lucky to be working in the group that I am. <laughs> awesome. OK, well, we're going to take a short break here, pay a few bills. We'll be back in about one minute with Kevin Wilhelm. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stand Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Security Matters Hawaii. This is Andrew, the security guy, and we're talking with Kevin Wilhelm from Signet electronic systems out of Boston. Um, this is our Voice of the Integrator series. So, uh, Kevin, what uh, what are you trying to push out into that market that's not there? Uh, you know, it's not quite there yet, but every time I turn around, it's getting a little better, is Bluetooth credentials. You know, ah. I'll call them mobile credentials is a, a general term. You know, the cost is, I think, where it needs to be. The technology is, I think, where it needs to be. It's just getting people used to having you know, a, a different way to get in the building, feeling comfortable that it's a secure technology. Um, but I, I think that's something that's going to take off sooner than later. It, it's, they've come a long ways with it, especially the management of the credentials. You know, every time I turn around, they have a slightly revised way to do it, but they've been really improving and putting a lot of time and effort into it. Yeah, so do you think we'll get that? I mean, the college campuses seem like the right place to go play with that. Um, I think also high rises as well. Where, where do you think we'll see that start to move the most or the quickest? I think you kind of nailed it. Um, you know, where we've done implementations already have been in, in higher ed. And, you know, it's having these conversations with, you know, private corporations as well. You know, places are moving a little bit towards bring your own device, but everyone's expected to have a cell phone at work, pretty much. Uh, you know, I, I think that's pretty standard at this point. Um, you know, and, and it's telling people, oh, it makes it a lot easier to manage. 
that's the key. You don't have to try to get a credential back. It's just a single interface, and you're just deactivating it. Wow. And are you guys playing with different types of technologies, or like just Linnell or just Asa, or what's your, uh, what's your flavor? What's your favorite flavor, I guess? <laughs> My favorite? Oh, that, that's a tough one. That's a loaded question. <laughs> okay, you don't have to answer. <laughs> a lot of different products. Right on. Right on. Um, yeah. You know, very familiar with HID, you know, and, and Asa Abloy. Um, we also work with Revo as well. Who has a uh, mobile credential solution? Sure, um, and then also Farpoint and um, a few others as well. You know, we're we're pretty open, um, and you know, anyone who's willing to work with us and give us good support, we're more than happy to work. With. Awesome, yeah. So you you touched on a few things there. So Brevo and, and we're actually these, these credentials you're talking about. We're able to move, you know, use the cloud. What do you think about cloud adoption in our industry? I love it. Um, I think the time is right. You know, especially if you're someone who's not pushing, you know, more than 100 cameras. But, you know, you talk about some of these smart codecs the cameras have now. And even, you know, two five megapixel cameras aren't pushing a ton of bandwidth. When you're talking about the cloud, the thing that I really like about it is IT staff is typically decreasing. We're not seeing a lot of people investing in hiring more IT staff. So anything you can take off their plate, and especially when you talk about patches and, and even minor upgrades and stuff like that, Move it to the cloud, it's just more reliable and more secure. Yeah, I 100% agree. I, um, I, I love it that video is finally getting there. Um, have you guys seen larger scale deployments into the cloud or, or more like hybrid models where people are storing, you know, maybe a week or two on site and then pushing, you know, the other, you know, what is it, 75 days, you know, up to the cloud? So we've seen it both ways where you're storing, you know, a certain amount of period on site that using the cloud for additional storage. Um, but also we've worked with a couple of products that are entirely cloud hosted. So you know, the only thing you have on site is a camera. Nice. You know, not even a gateway or anything like that. It, it's just a camera. The camera has specific firmware on it. You license it as is appropriate and you're off and running. And depending on the environment, we've been able to get those up to a pretty good scale. Yeah, that's awesome. I, um, I, we've, we've been playing with some of those, when, and I'm, I find them quite successful. Um, what about some of the, the uh, stuff we're seeing out of Intel with um, new machine learning and, and you know, being able to move that processing power either onto the camera or onto the VMS or into the cloud? Um, do you think we're going to see more adoption of you know, machine learning and, and deeper learning algorithms in those camera streams? Absolutely. I mean, we talked a little bit earlier about license plate recognition as a credential. Um, and one of the ways to make that better is by doing this machine learning and deep learning. And um, I believe a number of manufacturers have actually invested or worked with Intel to try to bring that technology to the LPR. Anytime you're talking about, you know, the unusual motion detection, uh, character recognition, all those things are going to be improved by AI. Yeah, I, I sat in a symposium down with uh, the Intel folks a couple of weeks ago down in San Diego, and it was amazing to me where they're looking. You know, we haven't had Intel necessarily weigh into our industry very much. You know, we've just sort of been chassis driven, but they're really starting to pay attention to the sort of the architecture of our systems and looking at how they can build uh, how they can take the chip technologies that they have and, and put them in our ecosystem in their place where they make the most sense. Um, are you seeing multiple types of um, machine learning tools applied to uh, like a stream of video or are you seeing more a single type application applied to multiple streams? Uh, usually it's more of a single type application applied to multiple streams at this point in time. Um, the issue has been, I mean, and that you can't do it on the edge. You know, in environments where I've been able to do analytics on the edge, you get a lot more flexibility. When you're building out, you know, a dedicated head-end server, it becomes more selective on what you're trying to offer in terms of analytics. So you're really trying to nail it down with the customer on what they really want to do, just because there, there's such a high cost to it. You know, these are very processor-intensive activities, and sometimes you're using specialized GPUs, but um, it's, uh, it's a large forklift upgrade and it's important to get the customer to figure out what they really want to do as opposed to just some flash. Yeah. Have, have you seen, um, or do you work with the police force up there by any chance? Uh, not in the city of Boston. We do do work with quite a few polices. Ah, awesome. 
Yeah, so the I'm interested in in where they're going to go with some of this body worn cam, and you know I don't think we'll have an analytic necessarily in that body cam, but perhaps the the streaming video could be processed through some machine learning uh, to help identify behavior. I saw an interesting one that showed a face uh, thermal, and you know it was actually determining the intention of the person based on where the blood was flowing in their head. And, and I was thinking like, it'd be nice to know, you know, if somebody's getting ready to attack you or whatever it might be, you know, or a crowd, how angry are they? I don't know. I don't know where this is all going to go, but uh, I'm interested to see the development of, of machine learning and surveillance. It seems to me that that's been the greatest advance in our industry in the last 24 months. Um, how do you think you know, the surveillance advances compare with, you know, integrating access control and using Bluetooth credentials, um, you know, as far as share in the market space. I don't think the couple of manufacturers did a very good job of marketing them and implementing them as a unified solution. But, you know, some of the real high end ones I've only seen for particular instances. You know, we just have a request for it and you know worked on them but um in terms of wire tail installation usually it starts with i want to do it for 150 cameras and then they end up doing it on two or three sure and once again a lot of that is because of you know the server processing power needed yeah. if there's the ability to do it on the edge or in the cloud which i, I think is in the near future i think that's going to start to see really widespread adoption of it yeah i hope it i think it's going to move our industry further it it seems from, from my perspective, and you've been at it you know, 20 years or so, the, um, we're finally able to do things that we talked about you know, five years ago. And it seems like that window of delivery is getting smaller and smaller. So maybe, you know, I don't know from what your perspective is, but it seems like things we're talking about today, I'll probably be able to deliver maybe in 18, 24 months. It's getting quicker and quicker to delivery. Absolutely. Um, and, and the key thing is, that from an integrated perspective, is educating people after we provide it, right? You know, all these analytics are great, but the user experience and making sure they understand the limitations of it, the abilities of it, that's, that's a big part of this. Yeah. How um, do you guys go to market for your users? Do you put on, you know, little trade fairs or do you just, is it more education, you know, in their space or um, what's your sort of market approach for uh, Signet? Kind of all of the above. Um, I think we do a very good job of creating marketing materials, you know, internally. We, we have a blog that we keep pretty well updated. Okay. Um, we're active in, in various trade fairs. Um, you know, we're competitive in the bid market. And we're also very good um, at cross-selling. So I, I said that I do fire alarm. We have a very large nurse call division. Uh -huh. And we've done a great job of, of saying, yeah, you know, you're familiar with our nurse call, familiar with our telephone. And going and talking about, you know, the kind of high-end quality work we can do on the security end as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are your so? Do you do security work in hospitals as well? Yes. Um, and hospitals are, are a little trickier because you're not seeing a ton of new hospitals being built. Ah. There's always some sort of existing infrastructure you have to try to figure out and work with. Um, but yeah, we do work in in higher education, healthcare, um, all the above. Absolutely. Yeah, the healthcare space has been hot out here because of the opioid problems. We have about 19 pharmacies that all really um, did sort of a major upgrade for sort of uh, uh, limiting access to the storage um, of those uh, opioids. Um, and I don't know if that's a, is that a trend you guys are seeing up there in the, in the, the pharmacies inside the hospitals, a much higher level of security being applied? We see more cameras put in the pharmacy level um, than other areas. We, so Massachusetts has some uh, cannabis that's legal. Okay. And we've seen a lot of regulatory requirements for uh, cannabis creation, storage, and production. Oh. Um, so that's been a good market. Um, the Department of Health is, is very particular on what they want in terms of camera coverage and camera storage. That's been a very nice market for us because, once again, it, it's highly regulated. So they're required to have a camera system, and, and they want it to work well. Because if it doesn't, um, they could have issues being shut down by the state. Mm, I see. Yeah, that's been a new one here. We have only the medical marijuana outlets. Um, are your folks end to end like here they, they grow, they, they grow, they ship, they package and sell, they have to own the entire process. Is that a similar thing to Massachusetts? 
Yep, so they can have, um, I'll call them storefronts as well. But uh, yes, you know, they, they have the manufacturing, so they have the growing out back. Um, they have the labs, they have the processing, and they have the shipping. Wow, yeah, it's, it's, it's involved. That's um, Hawaii got, has it been uh, a big market there for many years, or is it just, how, how, how old is that market, I guess, in the East? Uh, two and a half to three years. You know, it, wow. it's very, very recent. You know, it, it was entirely the legislation changing and, and granting licenses, and then the expectation that, you know, full legalization is sooner than later. Wow. Yeah, that's how Hawaii's going down that path. Quite interesting. Um, we have different, like, they don't view it as a, like, HIPAA health healthcare regulation. It seems to be more, um, like, it's its own cottage industry um, in the way that the, they define the security would be done. There's, like, no windows and... Things like that. Is it? Do you have a special set of guidance for those uh, facilities? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's very different than a hospital environment. Mm. Um, it's entirely on its own, and their design is their design. Wow, awesome. Well, Kevin, um, any final thoughts? We got a couple minutes left here. You know, I mean, one thing I do want to talk about is the ability and, and the growth of systems to scale across multiple sites. You know, we we talked about. Um, you know, all these awesome features. And the cool thing is, is, you know, you can scale that across a, a large environment. So if you have 50 buildings, the internet is the point now where you can, you know, distribute systems throughout them and have a single centralized security command. And I mentioned that experience as part of the challenge, 50 security guards out of the field and centralizing them to a professional controlled environment. You know, I, I think we're gonna see a lot of good results from that. Once again, having a real, professional, dedicated, you know, physical security staff is going to bring very good results. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending your time and your thoughts with us today because security matters. Aloha. Thank you, Andrew.